be able to be. But um, uh, it's nice that you're here and it is early. I can see you yawning. <laughs> But um, uh, so what I'm going to do, and I said it to Sarah, that my problem is that there's too much work and um, I can become, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to attempt to be chronological because we're talking about four decades. Recently, I've been putting together a website. The first 10 years will be done in about two weeks time, which is about time for me, actually, because there isn't enough material out there for people to know what's what's happened ten you know so we're beginning with the first decade and working backwards and i let sarah know when that's up um but basically just to give you fill you in a little bit and if your first years you're probably a mixture of mature and students and younger students uh, which is always very healthy um and it's i think it's about passion whether you're 18 or 80. um i come from cork originally i went to the, the Crawford Art, uh, Art uh, College for a year and did, you know, in those days, um, it was kind of this foundation year where you did a bit of everything. Then I went to, um, to England and did a three-dimensional design course actually in, in jewellery because I hadn't a clue what I was doing. And I ended up in, a, in an art college that had, was multidimensional, like Ireland was still a bit in the dark ages, uh, kind of drawing statues. And then, so I, I focused on jewelry making, but it became very figurative. But I learned a lot of technique, uh, but I was not the happiest time of my life. I was in Leicester Polytechnic in the middle of England during the Birmingham bombing era, not good to be Irish. Then went, came back to Ireland for a year, but still kind of felt that art was outside the sphere of, of, of Cork. Maybe it was just in my head. So I went, I got, a, I always, and I tell this story and it's boring for people who've heard it before, but I think it's terribly important as a student when you, generally speaking, you've no money. I wrote to companies to get funding to do an MFA in San Francisco. I wrote to about 30 or 40 uh, companies. My father was still alive, he was mortified, but he didn't have enough money to, he had funded my undergrad. And I got, most of the replies were just saying, we don't fund, we only fund charities. But this one man wrote to me. I went anyway, I didn't get money, but I went and I was working in shops and restaurants. But this man wrote to me a few months later, he found the letter in his, in his files and his secretary had put it away, like most annoying secretaries. And he said he wanted to help me and he, he funded my last year of study in, in San Francisco. So I really say, put it out there. You, you know, a lot of people in corporate life are really thrilled, a lot of people aren't. But there are those special people who might wake up to your needs, which are tiny compared to their vast amounts of money. So that's one just one thing, especially when you're starting out in art college. And I, I know it's terribly expensive to make work, um, but you just have just just have that faith. Really, it's terribly important. So um, uh, and I was out for ten years. I did I did another five years in San Francisco Art Institute, actually in printmaking. I was just saying to Fiona, and um, so they were they were quite disciplined undergrads. And then I started working in sculpture and came back to Ireland in 1983, which was still kind of gloomy, kind of uh, not very fashionably art time, um, kind of church ridden and. Um, but I was very glad I came back. I'm really glad I didn't try and stay in America. Can you imagine now being in America? So what I'm gonna do, and this morning I put together another PowerPoint presentation, just to try and break my, my own rhythm. So what I'm gonna show you is, it's something that kind of interests me is, you know, you come into art college too, or you, go, go, you, you are an artist and you try and create things that are, have been triggered by something that inspire you. And now this is, the, this is always the problem, how to, how to describe what that inspiration is, how to harness it. Um, and I kind of don't believe there's any such thing as a singular idea. And the trouble is in our colleges also, you're sometimes forced to kind of, when you're having a tutorial to go, this is my idea. And you kind of present it like a box of chocolates and it's all got its ribbon on. And I've always seen that struggle and worried about that pressure. So what I always have felt in terms of teaching and in terms of navigating things that inspire you is to try and allow as much in as possible and not, not edit yourself until things start 
actually falling into place. And it's very much about relationships. And it's usually about a tension between two things. So is there ever, uh, and I often speak about this, is there ever a brilliant piece of artwork? Is, is any piece of artwork better than any other piece of artwork? Because there's no such thing as one piece of art surviving or existing you know, out in outer space away from everything. It always is in relationship to something, whether it's to the ghastly art market, which has, you know, overinflated itself to such an obscene state. And, and unfortunately that filters down into, into our territory. Um, or whether it's about, you know, fashion and, and trends, especially now with more kind of social media pressure. Um, so, what I'll do is I've got about 40, 40 images in a PowerPoint presentation. I brought up this, I'll share my screen. Will I share my screen? Yes, share screen. Bing, 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 share. Okay. Um, and I'll show these uh, as I go through um, and, and kind of try and talk about them in how they emerged or how they came into being rather than what they are, if that makes sense. because um you know i i don't know whether you find this some artists don't you know and there are all, obviously all lots of different types of artists and you know you, you might be mad about you know someone that isn't me and we all have our kind of desires and, and that we follow but um i think i think essentially the 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 practice of making art is inextricable inextricable from our lives well it is from mine anyway and um uh you know, people say, have you time off? Or, you know, there's never, there's no such thing as time off, but also there's always the pleasure of excitement second of the day that some possibility might emerge. I think that the downtimes in making art are the times where you're trying to force yourself to have an idea. And that can happen in art college a lot because you're in that incubator, you know? Uh, it's tricky, it's a hard thing. It's a fabulous thing, but it's a hard thing. You know, I shouldn't be telling you how hard it is to be in art college, but when I first came to, back to Ireland, uh, I taught a little bit in Limerick, actually, um, and also in, I was getting trained down to Limerick, and then I taught an NCAD for uh, a shared, uh, with Willie Doherty, the photographer, brilliant photographer from Northern Ireland, we, we shared one person's job. And it was, it was very interesting not to, in, not to be full time, to be, but be, to be able to kind of go in and receive, you know, all that energy and remind oneself of of potential in a way, because everything has potential. So I, I'll start right now, we'll in, insert, play from start. Okay, here we go. So I'm just showing this one because this was the one I, I gave to Sarah to put out as a promo. And this is recent. It's a piece called Everest Erratic. And I've been working in a, an amazing studio in Italy, in Carrara, which is famous for, you know, Michelangelo carving his David and all that. Um, so you're in a kind of a theater of beauty when you're working there, which can be daunting in the beginning because you think, Jesus Christ, how can I ever even begin to make anything that is any way as wonderful as this? But I had got a CNC machine to carve me a model of, of Mount Everest accurately. And I found a um, stone outside. There's this yard full of old bits of marble. And I found this beautiful stone that's about... It's about five feet tall and it's like a glacial erratic. And I, it had been there for 10 years, so it was not as expensive as it might have been. And I said to the woman, Francesca, who runs the place, could I buy it and then place, have the CNC machine carve Mount Everest on top. Um, and uh, so you have this thing where it's about scale, actually. So that, that's what's coming together here is about the greatest enormous peak in, on the planet being reduced into this kind of Lilliputian scale on something that has been half man carved and half nature ripped out of the land. So it kind of reads almost like an iceberg and uh, a glacial erratic. You know, when glaciers move and they drop giant rocks in the landscape, they're called erratics. Um, but it, it is about that kind of strange relationship to scale. Then you know, you saw it in, in studio, which was much more beautiful. And then you see it outside Emma, on, you know, in not a very nice space. And th that's another thing about how work functions when it's put in different arenas, you know. Um, but this is the biggest thing, you know, physically I ever made. When I, up to recently, you know, I only ever made things I could move myself. 
because I had no, you know, there was no way of moving them otherwise. Now I'm throwing this in, this is way back to 1988, because I was aware that, you know, this is when I first came back to Ireland, 83 I came back, I did a few little group shows, and then I was offered a show on the Douglas Hyde in Dublin, which is one of my favourite spaces in Dublin. And in those days it had brown carpet, which was absolutely disgusting, and they wouldn't let me move the carpet. Cathy Prendergast tried to move the carpet too, they wouldn't let her. Then Anselm Kiefer came along and said, move the carpet, and they moved the carpet. Um, so, but I, what I did was build this platform as you come down the stairs in the Douglas side. I, I still want to fill that place with water actually and have it like a dive in pool, it'd be so amazing. But this piece, I'm showing a few shots of shows because this goes back to again, how things relate to each other. And I'm quite keen in the note, uh, in the kind of dialogue that occurs in scenarios. So that how you can, you know, even how you lay the things out on your desk, there's a significance as to, you know, whether there's a glass of water next to a cup of coffee, um, you know, or what is like a, an old necklace or whatever is on your desk sets up a dialogue. So in this particular case, I was, it was very intentionally trying to set up a dialogue between characters. And I had just read John Updike's Couples, the book Couples, which is fantastic. So I created these kind of fake couples, an erotic couple, Mr. and Mrs. Holy Joe, and you walk down and you became part of this kind of arrangement or scenario. And at the time, this is again, talking about economy and how you face something. I had damn all money. And I would run around into all the skips and dumpsters in, um, in Dublin. And they would offer up things that almost kind of present themselves. I would be having ideas in my head. So these enamel collars came from some old, um, you know, water cistern and their little holy statue hands, calipers, all things that were kind of thrown out and then bits of just little bits of uh, pine. And I would create these structures that implied the figure or implied some kind of human containment. Generally speaking, I never deal with humans. It's, it's about what, you know, it's about the viewer occupying actually. So the, <laughs> the viewer is the human. Um, and that was called Mr. and Mrs. Holy Joe. And it was about the institution of marriage in a way and very playful in those days, terribly, terribly kind of playful. So, you know, you had a mother with a baby, there was a shark lady in a ball dress. She was the first kind of shark structure I ever worked on. Um, and anyway, I'm jumping again now. So I'm jumping to 1999 to a piece that is probably more familiar to, to people because it was more, more public and it was called Go Ship. And it was one of these public uh, commissions where money is given by uh, a business to the museum in Dublin. And then they put out an open call to artists to come up with an idea that was non-permanent that would be in Dublin Bay, anywhere in the Dublin area for up to three weeks in the winter of 1999. Now, this is another thing that I really love doing. Sarah, you could nearly do a whole course on this. Is, is like to imagine without limits what you would love to do, you know? And I remember being in a pub when pubs were still open years ago, around the time doing the, the ship, and, and we were talking about what you would do if you had absolutely limitless, um, you know, access, material. In, and it's quite interesting to force yourself to imagine. And I should think about it now in terms of my life now, because this was, it was a very simple idea, but it was incredibly difficult to do. We painted it with phosphorus paint, I borrowed the ship and it did happen and it was beautiful. But um, it, the budget went from 40,000 to 140,000 because of the cost of the paint. The head of Nissan Cars, who was a bollocks, he, we totally fell out and he was the one who was funding it. But it did happen, it threw kind of mad, kind of passion from other people, like a sea captain, a lot of friends of mine, all kind of going out in the freezing cold, putting fuel in the generators, that kind of thing. Um, and it was, it was great. And the difference between that and a lot of stuff that happens in your studio is that kind of community of passion at times is something that I desire that I don't have when I'm, when I'm here in the studio. Now you have that when you're in art college and use it, I would say, just use it as much as you can. 
you know, go to people that even if you, you don't like what work they do, just throw your idea at people and trust each other, I think, to come back with some response or else say, I fuck all response, you know, it does nothing for me. It's kind of interesting to get that. Um, and if, if you can be in a safe space around that, I think it's a fantastic um, time to be in our college too. Because when you get out, there are far less people are, who are going to actually give you any kind of um, response. It's not even about opinion, it's about a kind of response. So I'm going from big to tiny. Um, and again, this is the union between two things. I had a boyfriend who was going to the Arctic and he said, well, will I bring you back something? And I knew that they had walruses, like we're fellow down in Valencia. And so I said, bring back a walrus whisker. And he did. And you can see they're hollow. They're terribly sensitive instruments for the walrus to find their, their food. And my grandmother's thimble, which is a little instrument to protect the, the, the human finger from sensation. So you have this collision between absolute excruciating um, you know, sensitivity and lack of sensitivity. Um, and that, I just, again, there's something about precision in how you do this. You know, I drill the hole in through the thimble and then put a little pin. So it's very, very kind of pristinely presented and uninterrupted and looks like it was always meant to be in a way, but it's such a tiny thing, you know? Um, I'll, I'll, sk I'll skim over these guys because I think they're probably um, the mo most, you know, known works. For about three years from 1991, I worked with Cow's Udders. I found one in in Norway in a, in a museum, like, like kind of, like some kind of folk museum where they had made a sieve from an udder. And that set the ball rolling. And th that's the trigger thing I'm talking about in ways, because you had a sieve that we might all sift grain, it was for sifting grain. And then you had a cow's udder, which was so incongruous and so surreal and so tender and so um, butchered, um, covering it. But uh, the Norwegians are so efficient and utilitarian. They had brought these two things together to sift their grain. Um, but for me, it was like Merit Oppenheim. I come back to Ireland and for about two years, I made pieces with using cow's udder, udders. This one, Virgin Shroud, the udder is on the head and she's lined with this silk wedding train of, that my, came from my grandmother's wedding train. So that's where you have the kind of acceptable beauty of silk together with the kind of brutality of the skin. And I would get them from a man who was butchering them actually to feed dogs. Um, and they'd arrive in an awful state. And in those days, I, I, ate, food, I ate meat. I don't eat meat anymore. But it, even back then, it was just um, the smell and the kind of pathetic nature of the animal was um, terribly powerful. And it did translate, I think, into the works. Um, you have that initial shock uh, and repulsion. But then I hoped what happened was this kind of collision uh, of... Um, Number one in this particular case, the teats reading as small penises um, and um, hardening when they dried. And this piece called Stilettos refer, had kind of the resonance of bound feet from China, which I had I'd lived in San Francisco for five years and uh, bound feet were, were made illegal, I think, not until something like the 70s, like it was really quite late. And what they did in China was they broke the women's toes and bent it back and they actually used it as a sex toy, like, like fucked up stuff. But, and they made these special little shoes that the, the toes, and the women could hardly walk. There was one old lady I see in Chinatown teetering with it with a, a stick. So this was about that, the nature of, of lack of comfort, I suppose really, and, and fashion and the overlap between teeth and um, uh, penis. <laughs> this fellow is, this is called Everest Shark and what's lovely when you get out or whether you set it up yourselves even within, sometimes you get these nice invitations um, for th a themed show. Now, uh, and this one was called Time Will Tell and it was in a stately home in England where there were these Iron Age forts around the landscape nearby and at the time I had already started looking at the shark you know from the initial shark lady in a ball dress which is now in the Hugh Lane and I had managed to get my hands on a, a real dead shark from a freezer up in Carlingford because they're no longer allowed to be sold for meat which is really great because the animals are being totally decimated by overfishing so in this particular case 
this was before I did Everest erratic. I had the mold of because the, the shark lived on the on the on this planet hasn't had to evolve for 100 million years and lived on the planet 400 million years ago. And geologically, Everest only rose to its height 60 million years ago. So you had this uh, kind of, again, this notion of time colliding and the kind of respect we have for kind of age and time in some areas. Um, so instead of the dorsal fin, I put this kind of landscape of the pinnacle of Everest. And I cast it to try and make it look like iron with this kind of rusted patination. And it just sat in um, a little old church in the, in the stately home. This is making it. Um, in those particular cases, you know, you get a little bit of money to, to make something. And then there's a deal generally that if it sells, they take back the cost of making it. Um, but this was with David and Bronze Art in Dublin. They're very good at doing big, big waxes. And um, you can see there how we brought together the animal with the, and the thing about the shark was he had started to decompose. I picked him up and from, from a van in Dublin at seven o'clock in the morning, one winter's day. And he, he, his, he it's like the, the kind of the foothills of the Himalayas because he had started to kind of um, subside in a way. But for me, the truth of the real animal was terribly important. And the accuracy of the peaks also, I'm very interested in that. So um, actually the other night on, on Instagram, I saw some weird copy. I must try and find it again. Someone had copied a piece of work with their dog um, and it was to do with the shark. I'll have to look for it. Um, I'm jumping, jumping guys. If there are questions and I'm going too fast, um, please stop me because I'm aware that I can bombard, but hopefully it's making a little bit of sense. Over the years, I, my aunt was a pathologist and she had bits of human bone lying around her house. She was the first woman to study um, uh, pathology in UCC and she actually studied when the Black and Tans were shooting around Cork. Uh, she was a fantastic woman. And I worked in her basement for a while and I'd find bits of bones. And um, this chiffon was a scarf belonging to my grandmother. And after Auntie May passed away and I, I had bones like in bits of boxes here, I decided to create this slightly macabre but also kind of beautiful button that connected to this chiffon scarf that would have covered my grandmother's head and they were called bone buttons um, because essentially and I'm going you know as I ramble through this I'm going to end up with a show that was a couple of years ago that is about in some ways um, looking at our own mortality and making our own structure sacred, you know, and not being afraid of our own, uh, our own bones, really. This is a show in Curlin called Sapiens. And it was, a, a, it was a project, I went down to New Ireland and Papua New Guinea. I'd heard that there were these people who, who um, sang to sharks to catch them, to eat them. And it's part of their whole tribal existence. And it's very ritualistic and it's very respectful to the animal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. And I came back to Ireland and had a show called Sapiens, which implies wisdom as in Homo sapiens. I think it's, we're the, it's the last thing we are these days is wise, but Selam was the ancient shark caller who sang a song for me when I was down there. And um, he, he started to cry in the middle of his song because he believed this, this really important ritual is dying for them as a society. And, it's something that troubles me still is even living out here where you look at something like Man of Aaron or some extraordinary film where you see people risking their lives out at sea in small currics in, in relationship to nature. Um, this was a curric that I found broken up on the beach down here. I dragged it up on the back of the car and hung it fractured upside down in the gallery and then had this gamut that I found stuffed on the shore flying upside down. So it's it, this kind of, it's against nature and referring to nature, but it's some kind of requiem really to nature. And it hung above Selam singing the, this song. And you had this kind of weird, when you were below it, this kind of re, weird, you know, sacred heart, a uh, Gothic thing going on. And this is a beautiful young shark caller called Shogun. I, like, I could keep you for 10 hours. I have hundreds of slides of the, for me, the, they were so, so welcoming and uh, it was one of the most extraordinary places I've ever been. They had no electricity, no running water. Um, but the Malaysians were planning to build a road over the island 
uh, just a few months after we left. And I haven't been able to hear anything back from the old shark caller. Um, but Shogun was one of the few young men who was still fishing and he did catch one shark, but there are very, very few sharks now when they go out, most of the time they come back and catch nothing. And when they do catch them, you know, it, they divide the animal between the village. It's all very, um, they sing as the boat is coming in, they blow the conch shell. It's, 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 it's such a fantastic balance. It's about balance and respect, you know? And, uh, you know, we brought plastic bottles of water and they were queuing up to get the plastic bottles and you were kind of, you had this awful split between, um, you know, knowing they would be helpful to them and thinking, you know, where are they going to end up, you know? Um, so now back to Ireland again, this could be Papua New Guinea, but this is outside here, one summer's evening without any, actually, there's no, um, no filter. It was like that. And that's Inish Turk and that's Ackle over to the right and Cahar Island. Um, so I did a show in the curling called View and that was the kind of the, the pivot photograph. Often I use photographs as a kind of punctuation. I wouldn't call myself a photographer at all, but like here you have an old a cathedral and then you had um, references to landscape. And then these sculptures that ran down the spine of the gallery um, that had relationships to each other. Uh, so the kind of the formality of presentation is something that I think can be really important. And I think seeing a Gerhard Richter show years ago on the Tate, in the old Tate in London, made me realize that because Richter used to kind of puzzle me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by a lot of painters, but Richter, I was attracted to, but kind of puzzled by. But in that show, he would have one of his beautiful candles hung next to his kind of Dulux matchmaker spirals of color. And somehow the realism and lack of real, realism, so a dialogue started to occur. And what I try to do here is a similar thing by bringing, and what I use photography for as, is as a pause. It's rare that I've ever made a photograph that I would call a photograph. Like here you can see on the left, is Cologne Cathedral that my camera jumped. And so it's all out, it's out of kilter and it's, it's almost collapsing. So it's a kind of a reference to authority that is blurred. This is another, uh, what's that number in the middle of that thing? That's gas, it's got, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, their paper impressions of Mount Everest. That's another thing that's like series, you know, like painters sometimes paint the same thing for all their lives. Um, but I've used Mount Everest maybe in four or five different things that has different significance. Like I don't draw ever really. I doodle in my sketchbook a lot, but I don't do official drawings. So this, these are beautiful pieces of handmade paper that this um, friend of mine, Elaine Griffin, helped me mold paper into these um, sheets of, uh, mold mountains into these sheets of paper that stacked on top of each other, like kind of a hat, a hat rack. And it was more about the physicality and the reference to the reality of Everest within each of these pages, rather than me attempting to draw nature. So it's a, maybe it's another way of drawing nature. I can't talk about everything here, guys, because it's too much, but um, the website for the first 10 years will, will bring in that. This was a show in, in uh, Margate and Turner Contemporary called Connemara, very original, but it kind of made more sense over there than it did here where again, that kind of theater aspect, uh, I love, especially when you have something, a structure as big as that, it was called Tabernacle. And you could go and sit inside it and it was like this weird little um, cinema scope thing. And then a projection of a sea cave as you sat looking out in front of it that exists at the end of my land here, which I didn't discover until about a year after I bought the land. And I, when the tide is high, it's full. So you, it's very hard to get into. Uh, but again, it's about, relationship so if you have some a dirty shoe you know next to um you know whatever that meet a, a you know bottle of ketchup you you're, you're straight away you're into dialogue and i think um and this I'm, I'm totally guilty of not doing this at the moment um in 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 my studio but it's it's about that hope of relationship isn't it um uh and then kind of harnessing it, I suppose. And then some things are so obvious, like over the top obvious. But the, and, you know, I think probably <laughs> critically in the past, people could say, oh, you know, her work is so obvious. And I think around the other stuff, 
it was a protective thing for people because they were so grossed out by the, the teats. And I was too when I first started working with them, um, was that, oh, you know, it's obvious. But I think if there's power in the material, it, 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 it leaps ahead of you. And this was a, a, a case in point. This little curric was made by the guys in Mehelmara in Cork, that wonderful uh, curric making kind of school uh, near St. Finbar's Cathedral. And I recently a guy there made me a curric to use, but this little baby curric was one of their um, kind of homework things. And I saw it and I said, could I buy it? And then I had been looking for shark skins and I do a little bit of work for the Irish Whale and Dolphin group here. If dead animals come in, I send them samples and things so that they can work out, you know, why they've died. It's terribly sad, but they're doing fabulous work to try and, you know, look at the populations of whales and dolphins around Ireland, not sharks, by the way. They did try and get basking sharks protected, but the government wouldn't go for it. Um, you know, anyway, that's another story. Um, so this is the skin of a basking shark, which, as you know, is a plankton feeder and doesn't have teeth. It came in to Wexford. Um, I left the head and the tail. Uh, it was about 18 feet long. It took about nine of us to drag it into my car. Then I brought it back to my studio. And this is the hands on part. I don't actually Hugo Byrne from Limerick helped me scrape it. I don't know if you know Hugo. Um, he was down here working uh, in a, a restoration place and he, he helped me for a week. It was kind of disgusting work, scraping the, the, the fat out from the inside of the skin. And we pickled it. And then I stretched it over this little boat, um, which has direct connections really to the Aran Islands in a way. And again, that sequence of Man of Aran, where they go out to try and catch the, the basking sharks. And it, it's a very powerful image where they get dragged along by these poor unfortunate animals that are harpooned. But here, the, the dorsal fin, reads almost like a keel and it's upside down. Uh, it, and it, 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 you know, it's a little bit, you know, you, you, you go from the cow to the shark to they're so contrary animals. And yet um, they're the, the two animals that I've kind of focused on a lot in, in, in life. Um, if I'm going to slowly, Sarah, tell me too, will you? Um, or too fast. Bloomberg, <laughs> I'm putting this in because I, I like, this is like, mad it's london it's an art space it's in bloomberg it's where they all sit at their desks and they all work out how how what the yen is worth or the pound or the, the dollar it's all about money and then you have this little kind of uh, geologically this splice of, of space where the artists are <laughs> make work so this was a situation where they they offered something like two thousand euros um to make a project and i said yes and um in the 15th century, pearls were one of the most valuable things on the planet. And I had always remembered this. And they were used as currency. And I thought, what a beautiful thing to hand somebody a pearl. And, you know, apparently Cleopatra, you know, had once teased Mark Anthony by grinding a giant earring of hers into a glass of wine and drinking it because the value of the pearl from her ear was worth as much as one of his armies. You know, it was really, really an extraordinary value thing. So... I, my brother's a zoologist and I, I again, this thing of um, like, you know, I am, I am leaping now to Tahiti from doing the thimble on, you know, with the walrus whisker, but uh, what I, again, that expansion thing is so exciting. My brother's a zoologist and I've always used him for information. He's fantastically informed. And I said, did he know any pearl farmers? So through his pals, I found a pearl farmer in Tahiti. I blew the budget completely flying there and brought the bones of um, a human hand in my pocket. And I was going to ask the pearl farmers to put the fingertip bones into the oysters to see would the animal skin them with nacre, which is the, the kind of scab of beauty that creates the pearl. Um, and you know, you can see kind of tchotchkes online, like in Hong Kong and places, they do little crucifixes that are, are covered in nacre. So I went there, this was the, one of the guys working in the pearl farm, these Tahitian guys, and they, what they do is they clamp open the animal. They take out different sized pearls according to the size of the bead they introduce so that the animal is then forced to cover it with this beautiful material because it's an irritant, which is so beautiful too. Because I always draw parallels um, to art for that because I think when art, when something is happening, in terms of an idea, it's like this fecking thing that just goes, you know, is irritating you until it manifests itself. Um, 
or doesn't. So he takes out the pearls and then I asked him to pop in the fingertip. And then they brought them out and put them into the middle of a lagoon in these little kind of racks. And nine months later, the pearl farmer, Philippe Cabral, he sent me back one fingertip. All the others had been ejected by the animals. But what was so beautiful was that in ways to have one rather than five, it was the indicator, it was the index finger. It connected a lot to a lot of hands I've done uh, or way back art historically to Michelangelo's finger, the creation, et cetera, et cetera. So I showed them then in these little display cabinets just laid out like that with this single uh, pearl covered fingertip. You can see it there. And the show that occurred in Bloomberg it obviously didn't exist yet. So I did a little video. I use video sometimes. I wouldn't call myself very good at video, but I just documented those lads putting in the pearls and um, bringing them out into the lagoon. And then we showed that as, as the, the, the hope for the pearl with a little um, text say, talking about the idea and value. And then in one room, this was a poor beagle shark that came from Cork Market. And again, before they were stopped uh, being sold for food. And my friend who was at the restaurant in Cork bought it, used the meat and then let me use his skin. I pickled him as well. And then we lined the, in you can see it's a male because it's got claspers actually. They clasp themselves onto the female for sex. And then I lined the inside with um, uh, 18 karat gold. And this was an attempt to talk about making precious. Uh, um, and, you know, the shark is so abused. There's I follow so many people. I made a radio program recently about sharks for the BBC. And I interviewed a wonderful man called Mike Coots, if you're onto Instagram, C-O-O-T-S. And he had his leg bitten off the age, when he was 17 in Hawaii and uh, by a tiger shark when he was surfing just before he went to school one morning. And he's one of the most amazing people, human beings. Uh, he surfs with one amputated leg with a prosthetic leg. He takes extraordinary photographs. He went to swim with tiger sharks like several months after he lost his leg. He's got no anger towards the animal. He, you know, people like, we should be listening to people like him every day of the week and not to what we sadly or have pushed in our faces because he, he's an exquisite human being. Um, and I was lucky enough for him to agree to talk to me I, you know, on the phone for this radio program. And we had a little relationship in terms of, you know, of, of his experience and my attempt to, to uh, make precious the shark. Um, and this then, this is about recycling. When we were skinning that shark in Cork Market, <laughs> the eye, it was, again, you know, there's a, a brutal aspect to this. The eye, the, the eye was there. And I said to the guy, oh God, you know, I said, I'll keep the eye and I put it in a little jar in alcohol. And I suppose I had a certain relationship with these kind of things from my brother, who's a zoologist, and there'd be bats in jars and things in his, in his office. But I was asked to do a thing in Lismore in County Waterford, which is this lovely art centre where they have a fabulous castle and then they have a little church, Unitarian church. And I was asked to do something in the Unitarian church by Eamon Maxwell, who was a curator there at the time. And I went down there and I saw those windows and I had been collecting bathtubs that I found in a junkyard in Galway. And I went bing, 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 shape of window, similar to shape of bathtub. These are the bathtubs arriving in my house. You know, I paid a guy a hundred euros and he drove them out from Galway. Uh, very, like very funny, wrecked old bathtubs. Then bring them into the studio. And then I got someone to help me to spray powdered gold to create scum lines in the bathtubs um, to kind of imply that, you know, when you leave a bath and if you're dirty, you leave a scum line of, of the detritus really of your own skin that is, is falling off. As, as I speak, it's, it's falling off. So here it was about some kind of alchemical uh, reference to, the, to human decay translated into pure gold. And uh, also the fact that these bathtubs would have harbored so many hundreds of human beings over the century or whatever they existed, um, and that they are no longer around those humans. Um, and it was it actually, it was some of them were like, that's like a beautiful thing. It's like Patrick Scott, <laughs> they change our, change our ways. Um, anyway, that piece, 
oh, then I'm going to go back just to tell you what happened. In the wall, I put the eye of the shark in that tiny little tabernacle. Um, and it's hidden, but the, the, the piece of marble that mirrors the shapes of the windows and the bathtubs, I found in the junkyard that I bought the baths. Like it was nuts. That's what I, a bit like going way back to Mr. and Mrs. Holy Joe. Some, it's, it, it's, it's like, it's collective unconscious. It's um, some kind of um, energetic kind of connectivity that things present themselves, I think, when things are flowing well. And that's about one's own energy. So we set the little eye in a jar behind amber glass in the wall. So you couldn't see it. So it's like talking about the Holy, Holy Communion. And the Unitarian Church um, hasn't been used as a church for years and years and years, but the little bathtubs were like a congregation um, where people had occupied those spaces before. But it was also talking about some potential transformation of the body, I think, but also some sacred placement of the eye of the shark, because the eye of the shark is a different vision, um, like how they see or how they don't see. Um, and the, uh, you know, everybody talks about the dead eye of a shark, that blackness of their, their eyes, but I've dived with sharks and, you know, they see you and um, never with the great, great white, by the way, but um, other species and they see you and they, they swim away. They're generally speaking are not, um, horrendous animals that want to, to eat you because we're not their food. Um, how are we going? Just, I hope I'm not going too long. Is it okay, Sarah? Um, I, I'll, I'll zip a little bit. This so, was a project. Sorry, Dorothy. Yeah, I think, I think we're fine for time. I are think we so. okay, guys? Yeah, yeah, we're okay. almost. I'm zip a little bit. When you're, we're, we're more than halfway, I'm sure. This is a show in, in, in Holland where uh, I made a kiss and it was called Strangers on a Train, invited to make a thing on a train. I had this image of black and white movies, people kissing. So I tried to physically make a kiss between two human beings. Very simple sh sculpture project. Alginate in two people's mouths, you know, that wonderful rubber that you can, dental rubber that you can buy called alginate. Spoonful in each person's mouth, kiss, push your lips against each other. Where the hole is, is the place where the pressure of the lips has removed the rubber. So that hole is the most um, intimate point of the kiss because it's where the lips have actually touched. So it's the opposite to touch in a way. So the whole becomes the intimacy. Um, and it was like sculpture project, simple but beautiful, very hard to get it out of the mouth. Um, oh, we're okay on time, we're nearly at the end. Um, but it was, it, you know, it was like a bone. So it was also, you know, you, there's something interesting too about art and how it fills a space for one for a certain period of time. And it's almost like a solace, I think, when it works well. Um, and it's almost like a confirmation that, okay, what we're doing in life is okay. Um, and that's where it's valuable, isn't it? Um, you know, it, that's where it's valuable. Um, so the kiss has, has passed and so it's like a relic of the kiss, really. Um, but it's also like a bone of a kiss. And the kiss did exist, but in that absence of the whole. Um, so here we are going to talk about the last show. That I, um, and it, it was a show I did, actually it's not my last show, but it's called Glance. And I did it in, in New Art Centre in England in uh, 2017 or 18 or something maybe. And um, it's a lovely little gallery connected to an old house in, in near Salisbury, run by a wonderful woman called Lady Madeline Vesper, who lived in Ireland for years and totally gets us. And she just runs this, she just does, it's a kind of sculpture park, but she also has this fabulous little gallery and she invited me to show there. And also she had faith. I didn't have money to carve stone. And I had tried from lots of different sources to get money and uh, she, funded this piece of marble and that then led to all the other pieces which then actually sold so I'm in the money with the marble but then I had no money so this piece I called glance because of this photograph now I've missed out on a whole show called Trove which I did in Emma where I had lovely time being allowed to access all the stores of the Natural History Museum the National Museum uh, originally the Crawford but it didn't happen and uh, the Museum of Country Life and I could select things from all these different museums and create a show. And actually that 
there was no book and there should have been it's a crime there wasn't a book because the collections of those museums are, are startlingly beautiful and we see so little of them um so in, maybe in time we'll do a book but um this was a painting in the national gallery that i'm sure i'm not meant to be showing to anybody and i'm sure i was probably not allowed to print <laughs> But there was a rack in the National Gallery uh, full of wounded, what I would call wounded paintings. And um, I was immediately drawn to them. Um, some people might say it's perverse. And weirdly, actually, I was in there going, oh, my God, that's so beautiful. Oh, my God, that's so beautiful. And a, a curator walked past me and um, was so disdainful and just said, oh, she said, why don't you just go to a, a junkyard or, or why don't you just go to a, um, a secondhand shop or something she said like <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but the thing was I wasn't allowed to borrow the wounded paintings because these wounded paintings are waiting either to be restored or else their provenance is unknown and people might have delivered them to the National Gallery over years and then nobody knows who owns them so this what they do, which is so lovely, is they put these pieces of tissue paper to, to hold them so that, and that's probably some kind of water-based uh, gum Arabic or something, I don't know what, so that they don't decay any further. So this beautiful man with this hole in his face, I just, I was totally drawn to, and I call the show Glance based on him and his image. And a, a, an opposite photograph that kind of goes in sync with it was this piece where um it was the first time i started using human skulls i had used a human hand but i had found a skull in a skip in cork no in dublin when i came back to live in dublin when i was digging around for junk i found a human skull in a, in a beautiful marble box that i knew was a skull box because of my pathologist aunt opened it thinking there'd be nothing in it that was a perfect skull and at the time I, I was going traveling and I sold it to a medical student for hundred euros. <laughs> and I came back 20 years later and I phoned him up and I said, do you still have that skull? And he, anyway, long story short, I managed to get a skull from him. And I gilded the inside of it with the, again, beautiful lemon yellow gold leaf and placed a meteorite in the orb of the top of the skull. And for me, uh, we're back into Patrick Scott territory now. I actually do adore Patrick Scott's work, but uh, and his, the simplicity of it. But um, here it's kind of like this iconic thing where I talk about it more as like our bodies, you know, in death and in the bone is in some transition possibly to something outside of ourselves through death. And the meteorite has transited from outer space into our orbit, which is Earth. So I'm bringing together something that has existed in outer space to inner space or the inner space of our bodies. Um, and I think as a kind of a unit, it's like some kind of, um, it's like, for me, it's, it's, it's highly kind of iconic and symbolic, you know? Um, like, like how the Russians use gold in their icons, just so beautiful. Um, and this goes back to her, her gallery in, in England, which has this beautiful glass wall. So you have nature coming into the gallery and the work going out into it. Uh, you can see the, the skull photo and some of these small sculptures were of other pieces of skull gilded with um, a vertebrae and a hand and a foot. Um, and they were very kind of, uh, it was almost like disembodiment and this, the telescopes again, which normally point up towards outer space were pointing down into these fragmented disembodied um, sculptures. Uh, and then in front is this little little sculpture, which I think he, he's a bit like the kiss, you know, it's like how to make a sculpture in one, in one go. And, is, and this is about very much about relationship, like the egg is the most incredible sculpture form on the planet. And it's one of the strongest forms, as you know, it's if you pre put pressure on eggs from certain angles, you can't break them. Anyway, this little um, uh, anvil, was in a, a foundry I work in in London and it's a tiny little thing, it's beautiful. And I said to the guys, could I make a mold from it? And that, that's an emu's egg. And uh, we put a pin in the bottom of the egg and we just sat it onto the little anvil. And it's, it, that's really just about, I'm a sculpture, you know, it doesn't take much brain power to work at, but that's about. And then I, I'll, I'll just finish with, with this piece. Um, uh, this is back into that extraordinary studio. Um, it's like going into some kind of weird um, 
Italian TV series whenever you visit there. It, it, there's drama everywhere. Um, but it, it, they're fantastically skilled. I've never, it's the first time I've really, other than having people cast something directly from bronze, I make the model. So that bed, I made, I brought a pillow and a, and a duvet and a sheet and my hand baggage on Ryanair. Over we go, we build a structure and we build a little bed with an impression of a head in the pillow. And then they work on it with hand chisels and power tools and they create this. And it's just, it's, it's amazing to watch them. Um, and this is the one that Madeline commissioned for the garden. And it was, a, again, putting it outside. I wanted to put it inside, but the floor wasn't strong enough, apparently. And then this was the last, this was in the snow when the show was on, which was so beautiful because it created another duvet on top of the, on top of the bed. And I think maybe that's where I ended. Yes, that's where I ended. So that's it on, um, that's it on, on work. Um, you know, if, if, you, if, if there were any pieces of work that you wanted to see that I haven't spoken about, I can always pull them up, Sarah, you know. Well, I stopped the share, will I? Yeah. yeah just, just for the moment. Whoa, there's an awful lot there, Dorothy. <laughs> it's like wrapped with... Uh, I, I always do this, I always talk too much. And then everybody goes, it's just like silence. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, stunned into silence. There was just, just while we're here, and there was one question. Um, Des, are you there? This is the seance part. Yeah, yeah. Des Mack. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. Do you want to? Des, this is Dorothy. Um, Dorothy, Des. I hi, Dorothy. Where are you, Des? Oh, I see you there. Yeah, hi. Find him. Hi, yeah. No, Des? I only I had one question, and it sort of relates to. Um, I suppose college on some levels, because these are students who are going through it. And, and the fact that as you go through sort of fine arts or, or those areas, you're kind of expected to develop your own, um, your own work and your own concepts and everything around that. And yet an awful lot of what you're talking about outside is a response to sort of exterior parameters or projects that are given to you. So, so it's still your development of, uh, your ideas and concept and all that level on it, but, but it starts with a sort of uh, maybe a structural point from other people. So which do you do you find that helps or not? Because I think sometimes with what we do inside in the college, we don't give any parameters, which which sometimes is more difficult, I think. I, I hear what you're saying. I might have shown you more projects that were initiated by invitation rather than less. I would say the majority of my work is, is self-perpetuated in the studio, but sometimes it's gorgeous to be given a link or something. Um, and uh, when I did a piece last year or a couple of years ago in Cork called Hardship, where um, Mary Hickson, who runs Sounds from a Safe Harbor Music Festival, said, do you want to do something on a, on a Navy ship? And I had had an idea for years. So then you can leap onto it. Um, but other than that, um, like, you know, what happens in the studio, it's, it's more about time. But also, I, and I think there's some validation about things being around for a long, for me anyway, that there's familiarity. Like I didn't show a piece today of um, a Bible that I drilled a hole in, you know, that was my, my, aunt, my aunt's Bible. And I had never even seen it when I was a kid. But it was in my studio for 10 years and then I drilled a hole in it. And then it became something else. And that's about, um, you know, the rose that blooms, uh, even though nobody sees it, as, as the Buddhists would say, you know, that, uh, that you do make these things that uh, are, that, you, that nobody sees, that you're, you do, you, you do, you, am I making sense here? You push through to the end and then it might be in a gallery. But I think, I think in, in arc, I, I love the mixture, I must say. And um, I don't like commissions particularly, where, and I, I, have I ever done them actually, where you're asked to make something for a building. I never get them. Like it was amazing that I ever got ghost ship because I'd never got anything before in my life. Um, and commissions are so corporate usually, and they're so, they're too many people's opinions judging what's going to be put up there. And it's all health and safety. And I think it's the, to the detriment of public art. Um, 
So I think that wasn't there at one time, wasn't there this crazy separate course called public art? Is that still happening? Um, that was separate from regular art. Was, am I imagining that? I, was, I think there was, you, you know, and that, for me, that, that, in Dundee, hmm? maybe is it in Dundee? Something like that. I don't, I don't know where, but it's a kind of thing that um, uh, you know. I, I think they shouldn't be separate. You know, there's a skill in making something that can be out in the public. But um, I saw a beautiful thing the other day by Christina Iglesias. Um, she's one of the few artists I've ever envied because she was commissioned to make a reef of Baja California, where animals were populated. So she made this concrete. She'd never dived a day in her life. <laughs> I said to her, I said, that, that was my project, not your project. And she created this fake reef. And then the animals came and inhabited it. But she makes these, she worked shows with Marion Goodman and um, she makes these kind of uh, some beautiful kind of rocks and streams and they're vast. So it's a bit like taking a piece of the coastline and putting it in a, in a plaza next to some modernist building. Massive, like we're talking high, high, um, I cost things, but I'm I'm deviating. Sorry, Des, from what you asked me. Am I? No, no. I mean that that, that actually answers on, on lots of levels. I just, you know, it it's sometimes sometimes the expectations for people starting out and yeah. of of putting everything onto their shoulders. I I just yeah yeah, yeah was curious yeah. as to where you felt. Yeah, but I think what I was trying to say in the beginning about that is to um to you know. What I love about going into art colleges is, is seeing, seeing the kind of, maybe something in a corner of somebody's space that mightn't yet have been focused upon, that can be a total trigger, you know? And, um, and like Sarah knows this story, but when I was teaching in Limerick and in NCID years and years and years ago, NCID was completely conceptual in those days. Very, very conceptual. The, the students' spaces were all empty. And um, it was all, it was so academic. Uh, they were terrified, I think, you know, and then Limerick was the opposite. It was uh, full of kind of bog and tractors and <laughs> aerial things. <laughs> it was very funny. It was just after Tina O'Connell was a student there and she was a fantastic student. And I wouldn't be that much older than Tina, but she used to kind of drive in her car full of just every 40 shades of everything. I, and I remember bringing the two sets of students together and it was a disaster, a complete and utter disaster. And they all blamed me because I said, I was trying to say NCAD was better than Limerick and Limerick was better than NCAD. Whereas in fact, Limerick might have benefited a tiny bit from academic uh, discourse and Dublin definitely would have benefited from a carload of Tina O'Connell's stuff, you know? Um, but so I, it is, it, that's why I started this talk about saying how difficult it is. Um, but I'm not sure it's that much more difficult for you guys, for you students than it is for me and there still 40 years later. Um, I suppose trying to find what is exciting. And I think, I think COVID has dulled things for us enormously. I spoke to a cousin of mine yesterday who's one of my most creative people on the planet. And he was talking about how stultifying COVID has been because nobody knows where to look, nobody knows where to find their desire anymore because it, it, there's all this prohibition around, you know? Um, and I suppose in some ways that's why I do Instagram because I try and find one frame a day to try and go, oh, there's beauty, you know? Whereas may, maybe people would say about my finished work that it's not about beauty, that looking at my dog on the beach is much more about beauty. But um, I think to, to allow, and this is where tutors are terribly important in the colleges, is about nurturing, you know, about nurturing what isn't seen yet. You know what I mean? Because that's what art is. It's about a manifestation um, and about possibility. And that's a game we used to play a little bit in, 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 in the teaching days was like, what could this be tomorrow? You know, are there five possibilities of what sits on this desk that could be art tomorrow? Um, and, and not to be frozen in the, in the headlights. And my cousin was talking about deadlines as being important. And maybe they are, actually, maybe they are. Um, I have an idea at the moment uh, for another ship project and I'm totally, nobody is allowing me access to anything and it's driving me insane. Um, and, you know, so that, that's half my head at the moment is this blocking. And then to allow yourself um, do something tiny, you know, wh whether it is the whisker with the thimble, 
um, at the same time is um, that's kind of the little treasure. Uh, if you can give yourself that license or like a lot of people say, listen to a beautiful piece of music, read a beautiful poem once a day, just to bring yourself back into something outside yourself. That's the other thing of, you know, you know, these rabbit warrens of art colleges where you, where you have all those little square uh, spaces and it's, 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 it's difficult. It's definitely difficult. Um, but I think again, um, generosity amongst each other and amongst the, the, the staff is terribly important, you know, because the staff are also artists, you know. Um, I remember in, in NCAD, the majority, I've been very bold about NCAD today, but they, the majority of them weren't making their own art, you know, and that can be a problem um, if, if it goes on for too long, you know, for any of us, I think, you know. Okay, so are there any other questions uh, that anybody wants to, to put to Dorothy while well, we still have her in our grips? <laughs> I'd like to say one thing in response to that COVID element, Dorothy, the students that you're talking to right now, um, they got a, a brief, brief time um, and staggered time, not full time in the studios in college in the first semester. And, and by and large, they have been online all the time. And they have really hard. played a blinder. They've, they've made amazing work. I mean, they've been, uh, we're, we're all really, really impressed with the, the level of engagement that they have managed remotely, you know? Um, so it is, I mean, it, it is. So I, I, it's, I, it's really, um, there's, I suppose, great ex excitement for, the future when we actually get back into college and they're able to, to be in the studios and in the workshops and actually meeting mm. each other. They haven't really met each other. They haven't been in a studio setting, working alongside and seeing that little thing you talk about, that little bit of something dumped on the floor that might yeah. trigger, you know, that that element hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's going to happen. And um, I think they've done amazing work under really horrible conditions Brilliant. and situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I mean, Super. Do you keep is it, the tutorials? Do you keep them on? Do you keep them online, or, or they're just gone after you have your zooms and things? Um, no, the tutorials wouldn't be recorded. Um, yeah. Wouldn't be recorded. They're just as they would. Well, a version of what would happen. And in how, do you, how do you show the work, guys? You just you know, how they, do you do it? All the students have this thing so, uh, called a Tumblr account. So any work that's made is put onto this account, and we can share the screen oh. and see them with a process and mm -hmm. then another element is where the students would, would just be working in their individual spaces wherever they are with their cameras on um, mm -hmm. and just you know working together in a kind of uh, a virtual group mm -hmm. um, and attending. And you, that, might, that might kind of carry through a little bit you know if people are secure and, and feel more creative in their own spaces when the studios are open again you know do you think people might still start stay at home and start working more from home or not? Ooh, want them to come in, want them to come in. <laughs> want to see them. You, you have know? to be in the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm allowed to go in, I'll be in straight away. Hmm? Pardon? When I'm allowed to go in to college, I'll be in straight away because oh, okay. I hate online stuff. I hate being out of it. Who's this? Who's talking? Who's speaking? Uh, Cloda. Cloda? Where are you? Yeah. Uh, I don't oh yeah, I see you there. I see you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I I really want to get back into the studios, yeah. like working in my small room with like all of my family in the house wow. and all the animals, and it's very hard to focus. Yeah, yeah, and I don't have much supplies either. That's the other thing. Yeah, supplies. I know. Jeez. Yeah. So. Well, maybe next month. Yeah. <laughs> the rape are going, Jeannie, yeah. Actually, that notion of supplies, Dorothy, because you, when I was talking to students prior to you arriving today, um, and they have all been so resourceful and, and finding what's around them, but a, a lot of, of what you, you do relies on what is around you. I mean, you, you find things yeah. and they, it, they yeah, develop it did, progress. It did before, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I first came here, I was like a kid in a candy store, you know, 
finding things on the beach. Um, now people still say, you know, the, I'm kind of reclusive here, you know, I'm not exactly, I don't know everybody, but, um, uh, you know, people who know sometimes say, oh, there's a dead thing on the beach, do you want it? <laughs> and I go, no, 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 no more dead animals. You know, that's over, you know. But there was a time where I was telling someone actually this uh, the other day that I used to, when I found an, a bird, I for a while I was making candlesticks from the, the claws of, of the, the feet of birds. And it, it paid my rent for quite a while actually, where I'd cut, it's, again, macabre, I'd cut the, the legs off the birds, um, throw the bodies down at the end of the sea and thank the bird for its legs, then burn the legs out in lost wax, a lost leg really. But then one day, my dog used to find the birds and I went to another beach about three miles away and my dog found a bird and it had no legs. <laughs> so it was obviously a bird. I had put the legs off, thrown up here and it had been washed three miles down the shore. So I was going, oh Jesus, you know, it's going to be on the, the local Galway paper birds found with no legs you know what's going on witchcraft in Connemara but um uh so yeah it was yeah don't do that anymore <laughs> sorry can I ask a question there Dorothy um yeah. fantastic talk that was amazing absolutely amazing I really enjoyed that this is Fiona Fiona, oh hi Fiona. How are you doing? I'm back so, to see you there. Just, okay. uh, and I don't even know kind of what the question is I'm asking in a way. It's just going back to a point you made on that uh, working with these objects and creating this dialogue between them. And you said like the hope of relationships. I thought that was really, really nicely framed the way you had put that forward. So I'm just wondering for the students and, uh, you know, uh, students that are looking at sculpture and looking at these objects and that idea of the hope of relationships with these objects or dialogues um is there a kind of oh i don't know how to put it is there you know some advice that you'd give them maybe to set something up at home so they could kind of an exercise in a way that they could kind of do that themselves that they could look at these objects and create these dialogues is there a starting point for that well i think you know well it's very, like that other girl who was saying is she's so limited by space it is very tricky but I think just by moving things around, you know, like even if you, I remember James Coleman once saying he has five tables and he's one project on each table, but maybe he's a big room. Um, but the, then if you shift things, cause I, I allow chaos to occur and then I can't see anything. But sometimes if I clear and move things next to each other, then they make themselves, uh, there's something that kind of makes itself visible, you know? just by moving so anything you like like even if it's something you know as mundane as as a a, a banana you know like i remember going into zoe leonard's uh, studio years ago in new york I, I still like her work a lot she did this very offbeat work and she was one of the the first people who uh, i had ever seen and i'm sure there are many of them who was you know after she had an orange she'd she'd stitched the orange back in with thread into the form of the orange and her windowsills were just covered in these things. And I remember years and years and years before that, um, when the Living Art exhibition was on in Dublin, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Fiona, but in a way, maybe I am. Are you are. This man came with the most beautiful things. I don't know whatever happened to him, we're talking a long time ago, where he had repaired things. So he had a little plastic cup and he'd repaired where a crack was with little bits of grass. And then a ceramic one that he had repaired with wax. So there were all these, obviously you can see I'm obsessed by repair, but um, there were these beautifully insignificant things that had become significant through his tender attention. Uh, a bit like when you see, my grandmother used to have her porcelain stitched, they used to call it stitching, when it, when it broke. Because they didn't throw it away in those days, they had it repaired with little metal staples. Um, so I, you know, and I, the different, you know, the difference between a plastic cup and um, a porcelain cup, the, the attention to that kind of thing, which is about en energy, isn't it? Like Marina Abramovich isn't my favorite artist in the world, but she did do those things with crystals that I always quite liked, where they were on a wall and you'd walk in and one crystal would be at a head level, one at heart level and one at sex level or whatever. And that was about pure energy because you know, we all know that crystals have energy. Um, so I think it's about trying things and maybe sometimes trying things that you're uncomfortable with, you know? Like, um, 
and yet people would, someone said to me recently, and I've, I've, I've re it really triggered something, that for years in my work, I was reacting to things. And that, you know, you talk about the male and female side of the energy, the right and left brain, and that maybe it was too emphatically the rational. And like maybe all those cow pieces were very much reaction. And to try and allow the other side of the energy to come in. So how do you do that? You know, um, you bring things, you possibly try and bring things in or you try and find it in other people's works that you can go, oh, I identify with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I remember when I was in living in America, you know, I adored Louise Bourgeois and why wouldn't you? Her work is stunning and she's, you know, she should be much higher in the, in the hierarchy of, of artists. Um, and there were a lot of her shows when she was still very active and she wasn't repeating stuff. Um, and I used to run around New York, she was showing in along and places like that. And I would get a sense of um, solace from seeing things that um, resonated. So I think it's no harm in acknowledging if you like somebody's work, that there might be some kind of parallel energy. Now I have a friend who studied with me in California. He's now living in New York. He n didn't allow himself to become an artist because he always overjudged himself. Um, and this is this is where getting back to the predicament of saying what something means before one knows in, in in your body nearly what it means. So he would he would wait for some kind of authority to tell him something was good or bad. And this is where maybe maybe you guys been trapped in your in your bedrooms for the next while and maybe it's going on too long but um there's no one really kind of stopping you from from this kind of uh experimentation but um maybe oh, i don't know what i'm saying now I'm, it is about going back to the beautiful poem isn't it or the piece of music or finding something that um unsettles and settles and um I'm possibly looking for the gentler thing now, and yet I'm working in stone. You know, it's mad because it's it's so such a hard material, and yet I think when you try and be gentle with it, it's um, it's got that beautiful, beautiful contrast. You know, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Fiona, I'm, I I can never answer a question directly. I no, go around. That's brilliant, this. absolutely brilliant, and I think that's a really like you know you've set them up to really think about, again, the materials that they work with and how do they consider them? So I think that was a great answer. And I'd just like to second what Sarah said in that we're completely, you know, um, uh, you know, in awe of actually what the students have managed to achieve to this point really? with their creativity, their innovation and their experimentation has been marvelous to see. Mm -hmm. So if they can do that in first year <laughs> under what we're working in, I just can't wait to see what happens over the next few years. Brilliant, brilliant. That's good. And you've all met all your students in the same year. You have physically met each other, have you? No? Oh, my God. Oh, my God, Andrea. <laughs> see you. Not everybody, but everybody, so. Wow. Um, yeah. You look great fun meeting each other. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the roaring 20s, I think. Yeah, yeah, party yeah. time. Yeah, party time. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Um, can people um, turn on their microphones and... Uh, yeah, is everybody's mics on? Dara's an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Instagram images. Thank you. You're a fresh hair. You're doing the right thing. You're doing the I had a friend who used to uh, used to sing a song uh, when we were traveling for art and he'd go, hey, diddly dee, an artist like for me, when we were getting on airplanes. <laughs> 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 You're, keep going it's 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 really we're privileged you know that okay thank you everyone thanks sir see you Dorothy. take care see you guys Sarah. bye i didn't do anything <laughs> <It's done. laughs> okay guys Michael Canning, you hang on there, will you? I will, yeah. Okay. That was great. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. Just loads of energy and doing. So, what did you think, Kuiva? It was.
is very interesting sculpture. Yes. Why, it, it, it was not my thing. Not to no, That's great. Yeah, yeah that's no problem. 